have stuff. All three of us saw a movie. Not same at the movie. same time, but we did it. But we did see the same movie. We, in fact, went to see Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, which is uh, just as ridiculous as it sounds. Especially for those of us living in the state of Illinois, where you see Abraham Lincoln stuff everywhere. We do, in fact, live in the land of Lincoln. Lincoln suddenly got cooler. Just saying. Yeah, I'm... Oh, gosh, now I'm worried about, like, the kids who are gonna be... You know, going to school now and learning about, like, the history of the state. And, and teachers are gonna like, have to be all like... No, no, he didn't do that. Remember, I did once people have, are to gonna have to ask. To and when was the part where he killed vampires? Yeah, remember, this is coming from a teacher who did once have to explain to a high school freshman, no... Dragons aren't a real thing. That kid was so sad. Where does he think they would live? Is what I want it to know. It was a she, and I don't pretend to know. <laughs> the they did at learned... least cover the Lincoln Douglas debates, as there was a bit of real history in there. Only a tiny bit, but some. <laughs> A, a yeah, little it's, it's, tiny... it, it, it kisses actual history on some occasions, but most of it's no. Yeah, not really. Although they did have a bit of respect for their audience in that they never said the words Underground Railroad, but they referenced it, and you just had to know the underground yourself. I was like, ah, well, basic the, respect for your audience's intelligence. Yeah, like, they're not going, this is the part where he says the Gettysburg Address. No. Right, well, they they legitimately had Lincoln. They had Henry Sturgis, they had Mary Todd Lincoln, um, they did have uh, Jefferson Douglas. They, they had all of these characters who were real people, they just made them fit the story that they were working with. That said, I feel like the story works pretty well without, even if, if you got rid of the Lincoln conceit, this would still work just fine as a story. Right. It's it, well it would done. Be Batman Begins Vampire Hunter. Right. But the story is perfectly sufficient without it, which is the reason that it's a good movie. Because if right. it leaned too hard on Abraham Lincoln, then it'd fall apart. Right. Well, you've got the, the joke the entire time that, yes, this is Abraham Lincoln. And it's played 100% straight-faced. And that's what's great about it. Like, at, at any point in the movie, you could turn to whoever went with you and go... Did I just watch Abraham Lincoln, like, have a martial arts fight during a horse stampede? Yes. Yes, I did. And that it's... was the spectacular part. There is an amazing scene, one of the few where they really capitalize on the fact that it was Lincoln. And that's, he's, he's sort of getting older and there's a montage and a time skip. And then he walks onto screen, and he has the chin strap beard, and he has like older makeup, and he's uh, got a bigger build and stuff. But he's like, "Yeah, I'm the president now. You can tell by my chin strap beard." Yep. Yeah, there, there's that wonderful shot of him just walking forward, now a full adult, just walking at the camera with the, the trademark hat and the beard, where it's like, "Oh yeah." He's While the weird. camera spins like, from upside like, down the for desk, some reason. With the kids playing around and stuff, I thought, was, I thought it was cute. Yeah. I mean, overall, it the movie works from the standpoint that it's a superhero origin story where we kind of think we already know the hero. Well, because it's Lincoln. It's not really much of an origin story because it's the whole story. Right. But, but I mean, it's where the character Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter came from. And yeah. that's the cool part of it. Most of the action takes place before he's the president. Which, I, right. I really like the idea of him spending a lot of time being the president, and yet inexplicably still being out in the field fighting, fighting vampires. Yes, be because part of the president's job is to escort uh, military munitions. Right, that would not make any sense, but I liked it kind of for that reason. And that only comes up once, and they kind of justify it. Right. Um, I don't know. O overall, I really like the concept of it, that... Yeah, he was a vampire hunter who decided, huh, in order to really stop these things, I'm going to need to have to be more. I'll be president. And there he were... ends up doing just that. 
infinite percent, by which I mean precisely one, more Citizen Kane references in this movie than I was expecting. <laughs> that is, there's a scene where he and his wife are sitting at a very long table, and, and that has got to be a deliberate winking Citizen Kane reference, with no oh, real yeah. meaning behind it. It's just like, hey, remember in Citizen Kane how there was well, a really long table, too? It, it, it was supposed to, you know, illustrate the distance between the two of them. Yeah, it, it's the emotional distance between the two characters that had oh. come about from the the death of their son. Because right. Remember, and... in history, Mary Todd Lincoln went crazy. This movie plays her a bit more heroically, and I'm glad that they did. I, I really liked seeing uh, Mary Elizabeth Weinstead in this role, especially the last shot of her taking down the vampire who had killed her son. Like... There was some wonderful foreshadowing that I don't want, well... Did Mary Todd uh, was... Lincoln just blow a vampire's head off to the degree that she did a flip? Yep. Oh man, I, I love yep, doing spoilers. I was going to refrain, but no, oh, we're we're all spoiler friendly here. Okay. So hey guys, axe... we're spoil this, I guess. His axe had a fucking gun in it. Yep. The... It was an axe gun. Just how ridiculous that movie got was worth everything. I let me. Uh, preface this by saying, I think Rufus uh, Sewell is possibly one of my absolute favorite actors for villains ever. I, I really liked his performance as Adam in this movie. Because he, he, has a good he had that suave, controlled, malevolent presence. Also, he's handsome. Well, he did this thing where just being there says, yeah, I'm in control of this situation. What are you going to do? He never had to, like, be physically threatening the actors in any way. You just knew he was bad. He's so great at those roles. The yeah. foreshadowing at, at the very beginning of the movie with the blunderbuss, where he's like, yeah, and you can stick your pocket watch in it if you drop your ball. And it's yeah. like... And then he kills Adam with the pocket watch, oh my goodness. And then no, he, Mary... He kills him by fucking punching him with the pocket watch. Yes. Yeah. Lincoln or whatever. punches a vampire to death. He's like, got it right here. He, he makes himself, so he just like grabs his watch and whips it around his hand to do like some homemade knucks. I was just like, ah, oh, that was great. Yeah, yeah, that, that blunderbuss line has two payoffs because there's the watch that's made of silver, and then there's Mary putting the child's toy in her gun. It's yeah. like, wow, this line came back twice to pay off. I don't know my my favorite payoff in the movie is the repetition of the uh, of Sturgis's line from the beginning of the movie when he tries to recruit Lincoln. The whole uh, kiss a girl or kill a man thing. Uh huh. Just, like, him saying that again at the end of the movie. Okay, we have to double-check this. I have to double-check this. To see if that's... Okay, because one of our friends brought up an idea of who that is in the after-the-credits bit. Or, not after-the-credits, is it, like, at the very end? What yeah. is it? Let me check. And I want to be able to see... Apparently, Joaquin Phoenix was supposed to be playing uh, Sturgis in this movie but had turned the role down. That's a shame. Oh well, as it stands, the actor that they got, um, Dominic Cooper, is quickly becoming one of my absolute favorite actors. I think this guy's awesome. He was uh, um, Howard Stark in uh, the Captain America movie. I think he did a wonderful job. Benjamin Walker does not really have an Abe Lincoln-like face. He did well in the role, but he doesn't quite look like Lincoln in classical well, portrayals. But he really did do a fantastic job. Uh, he, he kicked ass. I, I think he was great in this movie, especially that he handled the changes very well. It is not meant to be anyone in particular in that last scene. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I like the repetition of uh, the recruiting scene. It unfortunately is a shame that the movie but, uh, cost well, sixty nine million dollars to make and has <laughs> still only grossed sixteen. 
Um, oh, yeah, well, it is kind of weird, and I, I can't can't imagine that it goes over well in the South because there's that obvious, not even metaphor that yeah, the 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 entire Confederate movement was you know Vampires. spearheaded by blood sucking monsters. <laughs> I have no problem with that theory. Just saying. Did did we just lose all of our Southern listeners? Did we have those? Do we care if we had those? Not if there. If anybody had any type. respect for slaveholders, then they don't really need to keep listening. Just get get out right now. <laughs> Your flag is silly. Anyway, it looks so bad. one of our friends, um, Nate, while we were when we finished watching the movie, suspected that um, when at the very end when. Um, Henry's recruiting the next guy with that bit about a line only man a man only gets that, that drunk to either kiss a girl or kill a man and the, he slaps the guy in the back and drops a handgun um, Nate's theory was that that was supposed to be Obama and it was a big tie in Right. I, I was hoping Obama would climb out of the helicopter, really. I, I have a feeling had... that if that had been Obama, that would have been a little too much of a political statement. Mm -hmm. Admit it, it would have been awesome as hell. No, that would have been awesome as hell. Look, he was mentioned in been... the Transformers movie. He can be in this one. I should have been Michael Douglas from the West Wing. I recently made the President mistake Bartlett. of watching. But uh, apparently, the according to the guy who wrote the screenplay, Seth Graham Smith, uh, the the recruit was not meant to be George W. Bush, Barack Obama, or any other president. It is not meant to be anyone particular. It's just meant to sort of dovetail with the earlier scene of Henry and Abe. He also mentions that he himself plays the guy texting. There you go. All right then. So Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Final, uh, final verdicts. Hold on. What a ridiculous tease where Adam is biting Lincoln's neck and then it's Henry's arm. What? The... <laughs> that was just like, wow. And then I I called from like the very very beginning that the silver was not on the train. Oh yeah. Also, that Henry was a vampire. That was like that one was pretty one. obvious from the moment that he starts putting on sunscreen in his house. Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, was really good. I liked it. Yes, I truly think this is a fa a fantastic movie, and cannot wait to pick it up on DVD when it comes out. That's a shame that it's not going to make money. That's sixty-nine millions. You got to go see it. You, you know what the solution is: is you have to go see it again. Uh, a couple hundred. I have to go times. see it two and a half. Yeah, <laughs> I have to go see it uh, twenty million times. Not really. You go see it again one more time, and then you tell all your friends to go see it. Perfect. Basically, everyone who's seen this movie, go see it four more First times. First, you gotta make some friends. <laughs> like about sixty-nine of them. Yep. <laughs> Go. I did not realize Mary Elizabeth Winstead was playing um, Mary until the credits rolled. Yeah, no, I noticed and it that pretty was... quick. Apparently, they originally um, the the woman who played Nancy, like the the, the woman who played um, Lincoln's mother, she was originally supposed to play Mary, and then they got um, instead. Instead, yeah. Well-made movies not making money, and Mary Elizabeth Winstead makes me want to go look at the recent box office stats for Scott Pilgrim. Now that everything is done, oh, not even five hundred, not even fifty million. Nope. Uh, Abraham Lincoln has already made more money than Scott Pilgrim did over its entire run. Not surprised. <laughs> yeah, the total. Okay. It's kind of sad. Oh dear. Alright, so shall we move on? Pyro, as I understand it, you played a game. I played an adventure game called The Real Texas, which strangely enough does not take place in The Real Texas at all. It takes place in Strange Texas, an alternate dimension in England, where things are kinda weird. There's slimes. 
and you can shoot them with your gun that has infinite ammo. But the slimes are immune to bullets. So you can shoot like bats with your bullets, but slimes you need a wand and you zap them. It's a uh, kind of like an adventure game. It's got a fairly blocky art style that I think is charming. It's not quite like Minecraft, but it is um, lots of right angles, lots of low detail kinds of stuff. It it looks and, pretty strange. Just saying, the the little wobble that your guy does when he walks. I do, however, like the type interface that it has you do when you're conversing with the various uh, villagers. A anytime you click on anything, there's a box that shows up, and it's got some verbs you can click on, stuff that you already know about and stuff to lead you along. But there's also a text box that you can type random stuff into. Unfortunately, it only supports one word at a time, and there's, in my experience so far, not a ton of verbs other than, like, search and kick that you'll use, but it's cool that it's there. It plays mostly like a classic adventure game with some combat that's not a lot like anything else, but is fairly simple. You stand still, and then you hit spacebar or right-click to pull out your weapon, and then you just click to shoot, and the, it's pretty fun to do that combat. It, it is hard to get the hang of it at first, especially because the gun has depth to it. You have to click at the right depth as well as the right direction for the gun, but not the wand. Which is weird, because you'd think bullets travel along a path, but that happens. And then you're going around doing adventure game type stuff where you need, you like, a uh, girl dropped her doll down a well and you need to retrieve it for her, but there's no rope in Strange Texas, so you have to travel the world and solve other people's problems until you find some rope. And then you use the rope and you find a bucket and you put it on the well and you get the doll out and the girl gives you a thing and a ghost turns into a human. And solid adventure game fundamentals. All right, then. You're into that sort of thing. It's also got good music. It is... I wonder if it's still 750. I bought it on the watch sale. It's MSRP is 1495. It is still 750 currently. I'm looking at the page. It is quoted from Roger Ebert speaking about something else entirely. <laughs> Magnificent, a work of art. <laughs> oh man, I didn't get the second level to that before. You, I, I thought it was just frivolous and when I was when I was telling Pixie about it, and I was like, "That's hilarious." But now I realize that Roger Ebert doesn't believe video games can be art. Yep, he was oh. talking about something else. Two levels. And the guy, or guy or girl's mom, claims it's a triumph. Indeed. Uh, so for the price for either eight or fifteen dollars. This is a huge game. It's really long. I'm like 15 hours into it, and I don't think I'm at the halfway mark. All right. And it's got lots of... It's got a big map and lots of models and animations and writing, and it's it's got a lot of stuff in it for the price. Pyro, always finding those weird games that we didn't quite know existed. I, I had no... The, I just found this through Giant Bomb, as probably most people who play it will have. Because I've never heard of it prior to it showing up on Giant Bomb. But I, I watched just a little bit of video of it, and it's like, at the very beginning, you have to pay to park your car, and you have to search your car seats to get a five pence. Right. And then you pay the machine, and the ticket gets stuck, and you have to kick the machine to get your ticket out. And I was like, oh, oh, my adventure game instincts. Oh, I gotta get into this. And I did, and it was good. So good. All right, so continuing, moving on and such. Do we? Lots of stuff came out last week, and nothing came out this week. Um, you actually had a thing you wanted to talk about, right? Sam? The something kind of big came out last week. In fact, so big that we wanted to talk about it last week, but hadn't quite gotten to it. Yes. So that would be the launch of the Mass Effect Three Extended Cut DLC, which you can acquire for a fine price tag of already owning the game. 
those of you who didn't trade it in. Or really even just watching it on YouTube or because it's mostly cutscenes. Watching it on YouTube or... I, I watched the other endings through the GameSpot website. But yes. And you didn't mess up their name that time. No, I didn't. I didn't compare them with a, a dastardly retailer of used products. Moving on. So yes, this... So is the man who's looking to pick up Lollipop Chainsaw used? I was going to go to a local used retailer for that. <laughs> oh, we're only stealing money from creators to give them to local businesses, not, you know, conglomerates. <laughs> I'm doing a good to do an evil. It mixes. Or you're just a hypocrite. It, it makes a nice, great paste. Or you're just a hypocrite. Either way. Shut up and give me a cookie. <laughs> Providing you with the cookie. cookies. Anyway. Okay, so the Extended Cut DLC came out, and it expands on the three currently existing endings for Mass Effect 3, as well as adding a fourth entirely new option to the player. So you get extra cutscenes and extra dialogue and extra context. So the, the primary role of Bioware adding this was to help deal with a lot of the questions that were left unanswered by the existing Mass Effect 3 ending. And I think it was really important that they did this, because for the most part, it wasn't a complete ending to the game. The, the ending that exists in the previous version of Mass Effect 3 left far too much unanswered. It wasn't I, I, satisfying. I don't really feel that way. I feel like everything they said in this extended cut DLC was stuff that they had said in the original ending. They just take a lot longer and say it more explicitly in this one. But it wasn't I, I don't because feel like they added any new information. I, I mean, people had watched the original ending and went, well, what happened with the... Uh with the relays exploding. Don't doesn't relay exploding mean everything in the star system dies? How did how did that not happen? Because there was one in the soul system in the original Mass Effect. We we know that. Um how did the Why would... Turians and Quarians not starve to death? How did the galaxy get on at all in some of the endings? How do we not just have the entire massive fleet that fought the Reapers not stranded near Earth. I mean, there was a lot that got left out that needed to be said. Uh, a bigger question, why was Joker running away from the Earth when the shockwave hit, and how on Earth did your character's significant other and, and or additional crew members get back on the Normandy? And there were a lot of holes and so the extended cut DLC works to fill those in for people. So to, to kind of work in reverse, um, there's a cutscene added right before Shepard goes for the final push towards the portal that will take you to the Citadel, where your crew members get injured and have to be brought back on the Normandy. It flies into orbit just to pick them up and then leaves again. And that gives you a moment, a, a one last chance to say goodbye to your crew members, especially if you chose to take your character's uh, significant other with you. Uh, there's specifically a scene added that I watched where uh, Shepard says goodbye to Liara one last time before putting her back on the ship. Uh, also added a cutscene right as you trigger the... Uh, the Crucible, in which Joker receives the order for every single uh, allied ship to fall back, which explains why he's running away from Earth in that sequence. They also went ahead and entirely removed the Normandy being uh, damaged from the cutscene. You, know, you remember in the original version, the Normandy's uh, right engine ends up exploding, and so you crash land on that alien uh, planet. They went ahead and just took that out. Joker's a good enough pilot, and you've spent enough time enhancing your ship that he's not going to break it. We've also established that the uh, relay explosion passed right through things without causing damage to anything it wasn't designed to hurt. 
Um, additionally added the relays, rather than exploding in grand fireballs as they did in the previous version of the ending, now just kind of break a little bit. Like, the relay basically extinguishes itself, and the rings that make up its core fall apart, rather than it exploding catastrophically. Which I think is kind of an important addition. And then we've also added a second sequence to each of the endings, basically just explaining how life got on for the various races after you chose whatever ending you picked. So, for instance, my Shepard originally went with the control ending, and they add a sequence expounding on the fact that Shepard is now in charge of the entire Reaper force. And being the paragon that he is, has decided to use that power to uh, to enhance the lives of all the people around the world. He puts the Reapers to work at rebuilding everything they destroyed, which really has to be a little traumatizing for the people who just lived through that. Hey, you remember those husks that are made out of your dead friends and family? Yeah, they're going to help you rebuild. I don't think I'd want a husk. Just putting up drywall. Repainting. Yeah. A husk paintbrush. I don't know. Do husks moan? I know they like make they the gaspy screeching. noise. Yeah. I, I don't I think I'd want moaning. that rebuilding central London. <laughs> this one was Ted. From accounting. Uh, so yeah, there, you get the sequence of of now in control of the AI Shepard rebuilding everything. Also expanded upon is exactly what the catalyst is. You get a much better explanation as to what the, uh, the star child, as he's been dubbed, actually is. And that part is kind of disturbing. And, and really adds some justification to what you're doing. Uh, Pyro, have you read anything on that? No. Um, the, the Star Child, the Catalyst, explains that it's essentially just another rogue AI. Spoilers, God. Right, we, we've, spoil, we've spoiled this already. This is a spoilerific cast. I mean, he, he flat out explains, yeah, I was an AI created by another civilization to manage the chaos between synthetics and organics. And in managing it, the conclusion he came to was... Guess I have to wipe him out every now and then. Yeah, he was built to be like a diplomatic liaison. Yep, and just came to the conclusion that, well, we're gonna have to wipe him out every 50,000 years. So, I mean, that, that adds a lot of justification to the, yeah, you need to be destroyed. But the most interesting part of this DLC, by far, is the the new fourth ending. The idea... Uh, it, it is an ending that I had certainly requested, although it seems like it doesn't... They, it's spent in a much less positive light than I might hope. But I, it's good that it's there. I don't know, it's kind of the most believable of all the endings, I think. It, there's no deus ex machina about it. It's your shepherd flat out refused any of the options provided by this AI and decided to just fight on as he or she had been. And inevitably, it leads to the loss of this cycle, that all of the intelligent life that existed in this cycle of the universe got wiped out but through their efforts, you manage to leave enough uh, enough information that eventually the Reapers were defeated. It, it, and the system continues. The system ended. Like, the cycle was, uh, was eradicated at some point in the future. You don't know how many more cycles happened. But it's pretty clear that Shepard's cycle resulted in a failure that yeah all of life was wiped out or archived as it were yep 
But that event, but, eventually, in the future, the Reapers were defeated because of the information that Liara left behind. Maybe Shepard's generation had enough information to defeat the Reapers. No, Liara, Liara no, flat Liara out says in her says video that, that we, we lost. Failed. Right, because Shepard made that choice, and it's not—it's not because they didn't have enough information, because they did. They built they, the Crucible, right? They just and put... in other playthroughs, they do defeat the Reapers. Well, it's that they chose not to. And yeah, Liara simply makes the providing the there. same information to a next cycle could potentially have the same outcome. Well, Liara makes a statement that the Crucible didn't work. Yeah. That something we built else the crucible, had to be tried. Failed. So, by providing better information, I mean, it's pretty clear from... So the Stargazer goes on to say that, well, you know, we were, we were able to, you know, from the archives that they made, we were able to get this information, and they fought this nasty war so we wouldn't have to. Right. It's pretty clear that people in the future cycles actually believed the warnings they were given, because, you know, they weren't given in the form of bullshit mental messages. Yeah, they, were, they were given in a form that was able to be understood. I mean, we would have really been boned, and I was thinking about this while I was watching it, is what would, what would you have done if the next cycle was inhabited by sapient species who didn't communicate via sound? What's <laughs> this? could not hear. Why is this blue lady moving her mouth? Uh. Or uh, another thing is that even if they do communicate by sound, they wouldn't necessarily communicate in the wavelengths we use. Right. Because there are a lot of frequencies of sound that humans can't hear. Nope. That are it totally valid. Seems to have worked out in their favor. So, yeah. Eventually. The, the refusal ending, while kind of on the dark side, I, I kind of feel is the one most true to the Mass Effect message. That, that sacrifice is necessary in the long run. Could you maybe stop chewing your hand? <laughs> Delicious <laughs> hand. Sends of Empire. Uh, the, one the thing that I especially don't like about the refusal ending is any situation in which Shepard shoots a hologram and then the hologram is like, dumbass, I'm a hologram. Because I'm like, Shepard, Shepard, you know better. Why would you shoot well, a hologram? There, there's actually two ways to get to that end. Yeah, you though. can do it through dialogue. Yeah, but... so I don't understand the gunshot version. You, you'd think Shepard would take a shot at the AI and it would just be like, what are you doing? You know that's not going to do anything, right? You also tried to shoot Anderson before the cutscene. I did shoot Anderson in the butt before I got close enough for him to realize I was there. But just locking up and rejecting the options the AI gave me is not quite what I wanted out of that, and the effects are the same, but I wanted my Shepard to think, okay, well, if this war is a thing that happens, and this is a system that prevents this war from happening, then we'll just keep on doing this. It's worked so far. And and that's not quite a but, thing that Shepard yeah, can say. But Shepard's argument the was that, are... no, there is a war going on. You haven't stopped anything. I mean, right. The, but... the AI wasn't defining the Reaper's harvest as war. Shepard clearly was. But Shepard thinks whatever the hell I want her to think. Right. Uh, ostensibly. Well, no, Shepard thinks not. whatever the programmers gave her for dialogue. Sure. And the dialogue that I wanted was not available and is still not available, but I, I'm, I was happy with the original ending. Well, and I, and don't I, think this I was it. okay with the original ending. I just think that adding more to it was important. There were a lot of plot holes in the original ending that needed to be filled in. Plot holes like, why is Joker fleeing? Why would the ship suddenly explode? Oh yeah, and why wasn't all life in the universe wiped out when the, uh, when the uh, relays exploded? I don't understand the argument about the relays. Space is big. Uh, one explosion in the corner of a solar system will not but necessarily wipe out the whole solar system. They have flat out said that the explosion from a relay is big enough to wipe out a star system. Yeah, but it's very clear that the catalyst is doing things 
But it was straight out said at one point that Reaper there that relays cannot be destroyed. So clearly we it turns out that there's, wrong. There's more in the world, Horatio, than whatever, whatever Shakespeare. Thank you, Pyro. Wonderful quote. No, I I just appreciate Bioware's effort here. I wasn't one of the people who was raging at the I, endings as they were. I do feel like were. each ending is more significant as a result yeah. of the added context. I, I feel like I have a more complete experience now. I got more of the stuff that I liked. Yep. Yeah, all there three... are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Thank you, Hamlet. <laughs> I had to pull it eventually. I, I just think that having more defined endings for each of these makes them feel more significant. Having synthesis and what it means to the universe be more defined is actually really critical to what that is. Finding out that, yeah, Shepard in taking control of everything really did mean that he is in firm control of the Reapers. That makes that ending more significant. The only thing that I kind of am bothered with is that we didn't really hear the extent of the Destroy ending and what it did to the synthetic uh, races of the universe. I really would have liked to have seen something added mentioning the Geth being sacrificed. I would have liked something from Joker mentioning Edie dying when you pick that ending. But unfortunately, th that's that's the weakest of the endings because these things aren't mentioned. I, I feel like the information was largely all there in the original ending. And yeah, you had to think about it for a little bit, but hey, that thinking about things is fun. I, well, I don't think most you, of that information was missing. You kind of realize that the AI has goals of its own with its new dialogue. That there are things it doesn't want you to know and doesn't want you to ask about. So, for instance, when you're discussing the destroy option, it this time it specifically doesn't mention the Geth or Edie because it doesn't want you to make that choice. And so it's like, yep, all synthetic life, dead. It, it, it flat out tells you the ending that it wants you to pick now. It's like, this is the best ending. This is the only one that should make sense to you. It's also one that I fundamentally disagree with. Seems okay to me. I think synthesis is a really bad choice because you're forcing that on everyone. And I thought that control was a morally reprehensible choice. I still think it is, but it's the best of the three options you were given. Like, it, the, the ending dialogue that Shepard delivers after he's taken control of the Reapers could potentially go to some really dark places. As Shepard is, is essentially saying, yep, I'm God for this universe now. I am the enforcer and the controller of the ultimate power in the universe, and nothing can stand against me. I will rebuild yeah, like and one... be their protector. Yeah, it's like giving one country all the nukes, you know? I, I'd say giving one person all the nukes, not even a country. <laughs> like, Shepard makes it very clear that I am the absolute thing in charge of this universe. What are you forcing on everybody by choosing the synthesis option? You're forcing everybody that a new form of life can exist? You're enforcing everyone to be that new form of life. Uh, kinda, but not really. It, it's like saying, hey everybody, you all have to have cybernetic eye implants, now. Yeah, but that is not actually what happened, and there's plenty of evidence that it isn't. It's just that the new form of life can exist, and it will make some of it, and the galaxy will evolve from there. No, it, it does. You see that in the new cutscene. You see everything and... in the universe upgrading. Admit it, an upgrade is, by definition, a good thing. But it's also something that the universe may not have been ready for. And the Catalyst says it. He's like, yeah, we've thought about doing this in the past, but it hasn't worked right. People weren't ready. 
And when progress at all costs. When specifically asked, well, what makes you think we're ready now? The exact answer that the catalyst gives you is you. Okay, you've met one person in your entire existence, so you're going to judge the rest of the universe and say we're all ready. I don't want the, the, the cycle is ready. Yeah, the cycle has managed to. Send Shepard is up. Shepard is pretty progressive compared to the rest of that universe, I'd say. Okay. Yes, and people are kicking Shepherd... and screaming about like the world being a scary place for bigots to live now because we won't let them, you know, have the freedom of choice to be assholes. But you know, we drive them kicking and screaming into the modern age anyway. So... And they happen to have invented NASCAR. What does that say? What I'm saying is. You know, if it's an improvement for everyone involved, why is giving people a choice to be less good a thing? Why why is this a bad thing? I just don't feel like the synthesis choice is a fair option. I'll see why not. Uh, the, Everybody's happy. <laughs> the other all of the other choices than synthesis deprive everybody from the right to become more than they are. The right to Actually, Evolve. the control ending makes it pretty clear that everything got better with Reaper assistance. That you still you still see the sequences of the Krogan rebuilding their uh, species and their planet. You still see the Quarians eventually resettling Rannoch into a technological superland with the Geth's help. The only difference is, in the control ending, you have the giant overbearing uh, presence of Shepard. <laughs> And omnipowerful dictator. All hail her or him. So, yeah, Mass Effect. So, yeah. It, the, that was a good series. Mass Effect truly feels complete now to me. I didn't need this, but it didn't break anything for me. Right. Okay, so continuing. Pix, you've got something to talk about. Uh, yeah, Pyro and I actually did some playing in the new 1.3 patch for Star Wars The Old Republic. The Old Republic, it's still a thing, and kind of free to play. Kind of. Up to, like, a certain Up level, I think. level 10. 10! Which is when things really start to get interesting anyway, so... Right. Level 10 is where you've successfully got off your starter planet, and you should, be a, you should be about halfway through... Your second planet, so either Coruscant or Droman Kost, depending on which faction you picked. Um, level 10 is also the point at which you can use the new group finder! In case you want to run those low level instances. And the group um, finder so makes the game ones. way better. It's not as good as the World of Warcraft group finder was way back when we were still playing World of Warcraft, because it is not, not cross server. And the population on individual servers is lower, so queue times are long, and there's no estimated wait time. But once you do get the queues in, you get a random group that you can run a dungeon with, and then not have to talk to them again. And that is great. Yep, I, I, I do have a feeling that the Old Republic, given time, will continue to add those features that will just make it a better and better game. A lot of the features that got announced at E3 sounded super cool. But I... at the same time, a lot of those features are features that WoW has had for five years. Right, they're features that have existed in other MMOs that the only reason they're not in this one is because we needed to rush this out so that we could start making money on it and afford to develop these features. But it's cool to have. And Pixie and I have enjoyed playing with it so far. I feel so like there, the there flash are some points... problems with it. Um, mainly in that it will teleport you to the instance for the flashpoint, but afterwards you're stuck on the fleet, so you have to manually hike back to wherever you were when you got the group together. Uh, you can yeah, also use it to queue up for groups for like group quests on a specific planet. So say we're on Balmora. And we want to do some, like, four-man heroics that are on that planet. You can queue up for those. Uh, the thing is, you have to hike yourself over there. 
It's just uh, that feels me. almost unusable to me because either when I, I get in the queue and then I stand around in front of this heroic all day, or I get in the queue and then I'm off doing my own business, and then I'm like 20 minutes away when it's time when the queue pops. Well, ideally, you like... would have like quick travel or something up and, you know, a speeder, but. It'd really be nice if there was its own quick travel mechanism. But it's there. That part of it doesn't seem as valuable as the Flashpoint part, but it's still good. There's a lot of interesting content in the Old Republic that is locked up behind Flashpoints. There's like boss battles that are based on unique mechanics that I'm like, oh hey, this is not exactly the same as everything else in this game. I'm not just tapping 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, I have to know the scripting of this boss and do unique things, and that's exciting and interesting. But unless you have the social attitude that you're going to go get four people to play them with all the time, you can't do them. And the group finder helps ameliorate that problem. Alright then. So, Old Republic play continuing. What are you two running these days? Um, well, I'm, uh, doing a Jedi Consular right now. And I'm playing a Jedi Knight. And they've, they've been consolidating servers recently, and I'm pretty confident that the server we play on has been a destination server, because the population has gone from being light at all times to being very heavy, to the point that I just got kicked off spontaneously without even being AFK yesterday because the population was too high. Fair enough. So yes. But uh, that does make the world a bit more dynamic, because there's other people actually doing things now, instead of you're running around in a giant empty world. Old Republic is cruising along. It's okay. Alright. So, next week's plans. Uh, is the Amazing Spider-Man out today? Uh... Indeed it is. For a so we'll probably see that. midweek release. I saw some tweet on Twitter that movies come out on Fridays. The heck is this movies coming out on Tuesdays bullshit? Are movie theaters lawless wastelands? Well, we definitely have plans to work towards the lollipop chainsaw let's play that we've been promising. Like, we plan on trying to acquire it today. <laughs> yes. We plan on trying to try. There will be attempts made. Well, if people don't have it, then what are we going to do? Uh, stuff. And things. Dancing. Actually, I'm probably just going to acquire Civ 5 if that's the case. Oh, also, I'm joining the ranks of PC gamers in a more legitimate Woo. way than I have been. That's right. I mean, I know I play my MMOs and stuff, but doing all of my PC gaming on a laptop since forever. <laughs> yep. Pixie has actually made the effort to acquire herself a desktop. So, real PC gaming is in her hands. Or, or will be in about uh, two weeks from today. Basically just means that we know where all of Pyro's extra Steam codes are going to be going. <laughs> I actually have a fair number of those lying around. I haven't done anything with the Breath of Death 7 and Cthulhu Saves the World codes I got from the Penny Arcade game. I have to send those somewhere. I have a feeling I know where they'll end up. <laughs> up my butt. Alright then. So, um, I've got some brief League of Legends news if we'd like. Is it about server downtime? No, I'm not going to mention that because, frankly, it's a free game and you entitled bastards need to learn that. Okay, we're apparently... There are some hilariously mean people on the forums. Right, I've been reading it's some of like... those posts that are like, you're not paying for this. I'm, I'm even okay with people being kind of upset, but the ones that I find super hilarious are that there will be like an original parent from Riot saying that uh, we're having server troubles and at this point the servers have been down for like five minutes and then there will be a post like two seconds after that of people just losing their shit 
and it's only been down for like five minutes. So once you, once it's been down for like ten hours, like then you're polite about it. Then sure, you can go bitch and moan in this thread. But the people who are just losing it after five minutes crack me up. I think it's hilarious. Right. Like it. It's really weird that that people get so unbelievably upset with Riot as a company. You're not paying for this. Like, I, I don't know what else to say to people. Of course, it's not impossible to pay for it. I mean, you might love yeah. this game and you might have invested more than $60 right. in it. You invest and... when you buy RP, when you add skins to your characters or when you buy champions through that. And if, like, say, you had a tournament organized, you have this little homebrew thing you set up and you got some friends in town, and you're like, damn, this sucks. But I, I don't think that is the majority of no, the bitter the, voices. the majority of the people who are angry about this are the ones who are sitting at home on the weekend going, I have the whole day off and I can't play. I have nothing better to do with my time. No. <laughs> it's like... There are no other video games on the internet! Right. There are not any other free-to-play massively online battleground arenas. So, Champ99 has been recently announced and previewed. His name is Jace. He has a whammer. There's a picture of him. Yes. Pictures can be found at Surrender at 20. So, this is effectively, from what I can tell, a hybrid melee bruiser ranged AD carry. Like, he can apparently do both roles spectacularly well. He has a giant two-handed hammer that at any point he can uh, morph into a cannon. And you can't tell me that isn't just super cool. Also coming out soon are the augmented singed skins, which makes Singed kind of look like Bane. Kind of an intriguing skin idea. We also have the Infernal Alistair, who just looks like he walked out of hell. And Glacial Malphite, which actually looks spectacular. Uh, all of these new skins have just been so damn cool. Yeah, Jace is the first character in the game who actually can change weapons during the match, and with changing weapons also switches out his entire ability. So, kind of a neat thing. My, sis my sister tells me that recently there's been a new field of justice introduced based around the ARAM, all random, yes, all made format. Yes, I can talk format. about this. So, it's not a new Tell field of it. justice, because you've already been there. This is... Is it just... It's the practice field that you were dropped into for your very first practice map when you were playing as Ash, and only Ash. Oh, I remember that. Right. So it's the, it's the a single lane with two turrets in the field. One tiny little narrow bridge. Yep, one narrow bridge. The, the special thing that they did with it is they've lowered the cooldown on Champ Resurrection... They've made it so that once you leave the summoner platform, you can no longer shop, and you can no longer heal. Unless you die. Basically saying that, no, you get out in that field and you fight. Um, I, I recently played a 3v3 on that map. It's kind of cool. So all you have to... Do I want to try it. It sounds crazy. Right. It sounds like it would be just ridiculous at all times. No, it, it's really fun, surprisingly. Although I will say from the match that I played, Anivia is ridiculously broken on that map because she can just drop her ult and hit the entire bridge. Yeah, it seems like a number of people would have that problem. Say, Ezreal, Lux. Yeah, yeah. Those champs are a little crazy. I think you could just play, like, a Lux, Ezreal, Ash lane and just kill everyone from the safety of your spawning point. It's if you play as Sona, everybody is in your auras at all time. Yep. That would make, like, Aegis and Frozen Heart really good. Yeah. 
Oh, personally, I'm I'm just really excited about Jace. I think he's going to be a super cool character. The Defender of Tomorrow, as they call him. I, I'm really happy any time they release a, uh, a character from Piltover. And the fact that there's now enough of them that you could, in fact, do an all-humanoid Piltover team. So it would be like Blitzcrank, Jace, Caitlyn, Victor, and, I don't know, it would be a good support from Piltover. Heimerdinger. I like that we're getting new champs from different places around the lore. Also, this newest patch, uh, as announced, they are nerfing the three global alt characters. Uh, Karthus is having the cooldown time on his alt drastically increased, um, as are Shen and Soraka. So basically, if you can affect anywhere on the map, you're getting nerfed. Ah, I, I didn't feel like those abilities were OP, actually. This is a little like, crazy. Karthus, yeah. Kinda. But even Karthus, only a little bit. And Soraka and Shen, not at all. Soraka, kind of. But Stand United? Stand United is not that great. Uh, it is in high-level play. It, it gets, it gets uh, sure. really crazy. Um, also, something that I'm really happy about, Athene's Unholy Grail... An item that just came out in the game is getting buffed. An item that I already built. Yeah, like all I, the I time. take it on a, a because few of, of my different nudging. characters, and it's crazy what it can do. And I didn't notice when Athene's Unholy Grail came out, but at some point Pixie was like, "Hey, check this out! You should build this." And I was like, "Holy crap! I'm building this Holy all crap, the time!" Holy crap! It's everything I've ever wanted in an item. Because I already built Chalice of Harmony all the time. Right. And it's just like, yeah, hey, I already built Fiendish Codex all the time. I just put them together. So now that we've been talking about it for this long, um, I'm thinking we're going to end, because I want to play some League. Yep. I guess it's kind of like, you know, mentioning tacos or something. Once you, once you drop that bomb, you have to go get some. League. Oh, man. Let's go get tacos. Tacos in League. <laughs> Anyway, for this week's Nerd Talk, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. League. And I'm Parasim. And we'll come back at you next time, hopefully with our Lollipop Chainsaw Let's Play. See ya!